This video is brought to you by the savior of all, finally getting his well-deserved screen time. Sword Art Online Alsatian War of Underworld is continuing on three separate fronts as Asuna falls into another ambush in the ruins, Berkuli chasing down Emperor Vecta in the most daddy fashion possible, and Lifa who already had drawn the short end of the stick in the novels, only getting an even worse treatment in the anime. Yes, yes, we'll talk about all that amazing stuff which was the majority of the episode, as well as that controversy that A1 caused upon themselves. Welcome everyone, it's me GamerTurk, your best source of Sword Art Online information, and this is Elicization Explained featuring War of Underworld Episode 13, The Great Underworld War. Short overview, we have adapted from Volume 17 Elicization Awakening Chapter 20 Part 2 to almost the end of Chapter 20 Part 4, not an exact statement since we had three different scenes and all were adapted in varying degrees. But that makes almost about 60 pages and if you remember from any of the previous 36 episode explained videos, historically speaking, 50 page mark has been A1's limit in regards to when not to cut content out. And yeah, we, we did get some cut content, one that really disappointed a lot of Asuna fans reading her of her most badass moment in the entire series. We'll talk about that too, of course, in more detail in a short bit, I just wanted to say, despite the drop of the scene I was so expecting to see, I'm not at all disappointed by this episode, it was an incredible run all around. But if you're new to my Explained series, what I do here is essentially provide you all the vital information on characters, events, action, lore from the source material, light novels, things that the anime did not convey properly, or just did not have the time to, so you can still see the full picture. If you want to jump to specific events, timestamps will be in the description, along with Amazon and Book Depository affiliate links so you can grab the light novels for yourselves. With that, let's cast away the sly foxes spreading misinformation and get on with Elicization Explained. The first scene is... obviously, it's a replay of where we left Solus's descent in Underworld last time around, with Asuna and Shinon reuniting. I covered this back in my episode 12 Explained, however, back then, while I assumed we would start again with this exact scene, I was under the impression they would cover Higa's explanation on the super account abilities, so I'll quickly talk about that. Solus, compared to the three other super accounts, Stacia, Terraria and Vecta, has a distinct advantage. Not only does she come with an account ability, which allows her to fly on her own without a limit, but also a weapon with a special ability, the Annihilation Bow. In fact, Shinon even mentions this in the episode 12 cut of this scene too. With smaller bows you can usually fire quite rapidly as long as you can complete the motion of grabbing an arrow and pulling it back fast enough, however the annihilation bow does not utilize any arrows. It actually functions very similarly to Dusolbert's conflagration bow under perfect weapon control utilizing spatial resources as ammo. But unlike the conflagration bow, the Annihilation Bow recharges itself without the need of external spatial resource availability. And even further, she has multiple different options to attack. She doesn't need a full charge at all times to fire anything, she can simply utilize the bow like a bolt action sniper rifle expending little charge, or she can go full Annihilation mode with all the carpet bombing stuff when it has full charge. But that should cover the Shinon scene again, parts of this scene explanation was already in the episode 12 explained about 6 months ago. And what follows this is the magnificent opening. I don't get why people claim the opening is too spoilery. Was there anyone who thought Kirito would not wake up in the final core of Elicization and thus got spoiled by seeing him wake up? Was there anyone not expecting him to not fight Gabriel Miller? From what I can see, the only people complaining about spoilers in the opening are the people who had no way of understanding the actual spoilers featured in the trailer, such as the nightmare sequence or the symbolism of Kirito's bond slash remnants in others. Simply put, people complaining about spoilers aren't even aware of the actual depth of the opening or what is about to come in the future. If you want to learn about the actual stuff, my opening explained is available for you to watch already. But with that, we move on to the scene with Kirito and Shinon in the carriage. I love this scene, despite the fact that I full well know some people will take this scene the wrong way as usual, this scene is adapted so perfectly and while unaware, 
Shinon was actually very close to somewhat waking up Kirito in this scene if she only had a little bit more knowledge on the phenomenon known as incarnation. She was successfully achieving what Alice had tried to do back in the tent scene, properly conveying her thoughts to him via incarnation. Back when Asuna had first found Kirito, it wasn't any sort of incarnation going on on Asuna's side, it was really just Kirito reacting to the presence of Asuna that he felt. Here, Kirito is not reacting to the presence of Shinon, quite the contrary, he is reacting to her incarnation reaching him instead. That's why Shinon's inner monologue is key here, it's the reason why it's a massive callback to what Kirito had said back in the third bullet of bullets. The you that lives inside people, Kirito had called it back then. That is the exact phrase that she is referring to in the inner monologue. The you, the Kirito that lives inside her as memories. And of course, those of you who have a good understanding of the concept of memories and image in Underworld can also come to certain assumptions now with all the talk about soul and memories and these connections, but I will reserve further explanation for now until the anime actually gets there, just something to think about for now for ya. You have already seen the effect of this moment in the earlier trailers, which means it's either next episode or the one after. What follows is Shinon taken to the skies once again to chase Alice, but as she does, she wonders where Sugoha would have appeared considering they were supposedly logged in at the same time. And that is what brings us to the far north, at the end of the ravine where the Great Eastern Gate once stood on the other end. I absolutely love Terraria's entrance, it's just so fitting and mirrors Kirito's entrance to Aelo back in Fairy Dance 2. As for why Leafa spawns here, since the anime skipped it, let's get into it. You see, Suguha always hated brand new equipment. She never used a brand new Shinai in a Kendo competition and never trusted the new device she bought for a little bit of time. For some reason, she always seemed to have a streak of bad luck when it came to trying out new products ending up being defective. And the 6th STL unit at the Roppongi branch of Wrath was so new that its plastic wraps had to be torn up before she could start the dive. So maybe due to some calibration error, or perhaps due to her negative belief taking shape via incarnation upon diving, she had appeared in a completely different location where she was supposed to. As for the scene with Lil Pilin, I also love the scene as well. As I always say, Leafa did draw the shortest stick possible, but she gets the most badass scenes overall, despite all the horrible things she has to endure. She's such a breath of fresh air in this scene, with her voice actor so casual and friendly, it's incredible. As for Lil Pilin, you probably don't feel where his confusion or act comes from, because his entire backstory was cut from the anime back in the first half. It wasn't an extensive backstory by any means, like Shasta had got cut for him, but it was more than enough to give his reactions a whole lot of content. You see, Lil Pilin was always known as beautiful dot 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 for an orc. The entire race, including him, always lived a life inferior to the human ruled dark territory, with dark knights and dark mages having high ranks, pugilists and assassins respected, whereas the orcs were always second class citizens, much like goblins and giants. That's why it was so important for him, staggering in fact, that this beautiful lady was treating him pretty much as an equal, not at all looking down on him like he had endured his entire life. Also, the people talking about, why should I care about the pig person, well, you guys completely missed the point of elicization from the start, or maybe just our future prospect Kikoga Sejiro's, who knows. All Flucklights in Underworld, regardless of their looks, are human Flucklights, thus Leafa's approach to Lil Pilin. Humanity has indeed come a long way to accept people of different colors, yet it seems the concept of simply being human, regardless of the outlook, it still slips out of the minds of some people in this day and age. But then approaches Miss Controversy 2020. <laughs> to be frank, let's get the good stuff and informational stuff out of the way first before we get to the controversy. I love DIL's animation of slowly taking shape. I told you all those episodes ago that it would not be the last time you're seeing DIL on screen. I thought it was very clear, especially in the anime where she was taken off screen, obviously executing a plan with a massive grin on her face back then, yet some people did not see it coming somehow? 
Either way, this animation is absolutely stunning. Secondly, the informational bit, the anime having no narrations, it was a bit subtle and well, I believe it was clear enough, some people still glossed over it from what I've seen, Terraria's super account ability, she is the goddess of earth, the giver of life. Her ability is a cursed blessing in a sense. The ability procs once her HP is brought down to a certain point, creating spatial vegetation around her and then consuming the energy back into health. It functions just the same even in the wastelands of the dark territory, so essentially she cannot die unless taking a single killing blow, which is quite hard for a god account, which means in a case like this she has to endure the pain endlessly. Remember, HP recovering does not mean the pain goes away by any means, HP is just a metric that decides whether you're alive or not. The pain exists as long as the wounds do, and they used colors perfectly to convey the regeneration, though I can see the pain being the confusing bit here. Most people would think that it would feel better once you get your HP back, so I felt clarifying that was kinda important. Yes, Leafa gets her HP back, which brings color back to her skin and eyes, but that does not change the fact that the worms squishing and biting into her like no tomorrow. The pain remains the same and that's why when she regenerates, she continues to yell in that pain. One last thing before we get there, some people may have an issue with Leafa's thing she cannot kill anyone before understanding what's going on. That is understandable with the lack of context on the sentiment, but you see, the moment she was told about the ability of the account making her nigh unkillable, she had made up her mind. She was going in with an expendable life that was very unlikely to be taken away anyways, however every floodlight she would kill in that world, not the masses from the US, specifically the artificial floodlights living in Underworld, would die their final deaths. So her priority was to understand what she was fighting in any case and only then decide whether she was to kill or not. We, as the audience, knew D.I.L. was an evil fuck since the beginning. Leafa did not. And please do keep listening before you say, but Gamer Turk, she was like doing stuff with the worms and all, I feel it was very clear. Yeah, 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 of course you do, because however you look at it, you and I are approaching this with a bias, whereas Leafa had absolutely zero clues on why the woman that literally took shape from the void needed that healing to take proper form again. She actually needed that healing, Leafa knew that bit, she just didn't know why. With her spare life, she swore not to kill anyone without a reason, and thus she needed to know the true motives of D.I.L. before she decided to kill her. Her mindset was to proceed with ultimate mercy, and that is something the audience needs to understand here in regards to how she thinks. And once she realized, well, yeah, this bitch is completely evil, that's when shit hit the fan. But with no more to explain here, let's get to the controversy. People like to shit on Reiki and the series as a whole for these kinds of things, so I gotta say, while I do not agree with the previous causes of backlashes in the previous episodes, I wholeheartedly agree with this one in this episode, but I want to add here that this instance, it's not Reki's doing in the first place. It is A1 adding their own quote unquote creative liberties into the scene for no reason whatsoever. This scene in the novels, yes, it is uncomfortable, not because of any sexual reasons, but because Leafa is effectively stuck in an endless torture loop of dying and regenerating. It is uncomfortable because the pain Leafa feels is too real in the books, too agonizing. It is painful to read through in the novels for, let's say, the right reasons. You know, the, the first handworms going in is pretty accurate on its own in the anime too. They are simply going for main arteries, organs and the heart itself to drain blood to gain HP. The second half, however, with the second hand, A1 simply creates a massive problem where there was none in the first place. And that portion, yes, it is incredibly uncomfortable to watch for all the obvious and wrong reasons. That is all I have to say on this scene. As for the people outraged by the scene, and by outraged, I really mean outraged, you know, the ones that are actually going full on batshit crazy. Get a life, people. 
We all know it's a terrible scene, but get a reality check. You're yelling on Twitter trying to enact cancel culture on an animated TV show in Japan. We all know it's a terrible scene. Some of us are just not idiots to do what you're trying to do. We can say that should have never happened in the first place and move on with that knowledge in our minds because we're normal people. Frustration and disgust? It's understandable. When you cross the line to make it your lifelong goal for the total of 5 days to call for boycott on Twitter, that's idiotic. You wanna make the world a better place? You start doing that by stopping complaining about animated shows on Twitter and actually contributing to the real world in a meaningful way. Glorifying abuse, my ass. Uh, as if there will be people watching this and think, Oh, I should do this to the others on the street. New newsflash, idiot, if you categorize an obviously evil person doing an obviously evil and disgusting thing as quote-unquote glorifying, then you are part of the problem. This is the opposite of glorifying and everyone knows that. That's why everyone is disgusted by this scene. Anyways, I, I want to be done with this at this point. Sad that Lil Pilin breaking his seal of the right eye, becoming the third floodlight after Alice and Yujiro to achieve it, had to be overshadowed by such a controversy. It was such an intense scene as well, with Lil questioning everything he knew for his entire life, losing the eye during the lunch and thus losing depth perception, hence only managing to get a minor hit in, etc. I know it doesn't make up for how this scene was adapted, but the epic Alo team kicking in when Leafa gets back to her feet is very much badass nonetheless. And with this out of the way, I look forward to her scenes that won't be as uncomfortable as this one. The short Asuna scene that followed was perfect, especially Asuna's animation. She moves all around the frame, yet it never feels like an eyesore to follow her movements. So whoever was in charge of this portion, he did a fucking incredible job here. But of course, the ghost of the past watches from the top of the pillars. Next, we move on to Berkuli, yet another one of those things the anime did great this week. Bundling multiple different Berkuli instances into a single continuous set piece, as was the case since the beginning of War of Underworld, the scenes are incredibly fragmented in this portion of the story as everything is happening simultaneously, but that would be incredibly jarring for a fast-paced anime like this, so I'm really glad they bundled Berkuli's scenes together into a single one. I love how he apologizes from the dragon that is completely under the control of Emperor Vector at this point as a sign of respect, which is the reason why he hasn't been able to catch up. Normally, Vector's dragon should get exhausted faster than Berkuli's, who was switching in between the three to conserve their flying slash carrying limit for a longer time. But eventually, we get to see him use the other edge of his time splitting sword, cutting the past. Though, I love the fact that he needs to explain it to himself in the anime in a loud voice with Uragiri cuts the past. They could have just not made his mouth move at all so it would become an inner monologue. What's the deal with the anime stuff hating inner monologues so much? I mean, when he jumps down, it's a full-on and beautiful inner monologue, so I don't see what the problem is. Anyways, his order for the dragons to retreat is something to keep in your mind, and the way he keeps the glide slash running downwards is that he's simply using wind elements with each step to provide some minor upwards momentum to keep his descent stable. Anyways, this entire thing is beautifully adapted. The emotion on the faces of both Berkuli and Gabriel, all their movements weigh a ton, it's, it's absolutely incredible. But you finally get a taste of Vecta's ability properly. I mentioned this back in previous episodes, but his power is mainly the control and manipulation of others' conscience and thoughts. It's even in underworld lore, remember all the way back in the beginning. That is exactly why people who lose their memories are considered the lost children of Vector, because his act in the lore is that he kidnaps and manipulates the memories of those people. It is exactly the same as the super account, which includes draining the incarnation of others, as well as making their mind go completely numb, which you have seen when he kidnapped Alice first a couple episodes ago. Hell, I, I love the effects they used when he makes Berkuli lose his grip on his mind, that hollow animation and empty eyes, it looks incredible. So while Gabe is not all that skilled with a sword, overall he still has a massive advantage solely due to being Vector here. However, the fight is not yet over, so we'll get back to all this action in the next episode. I have nothing more to explain in this beautiful adaptation, so we'll move on for now. The books make it very clear how this fight is gonna conclude, but I feel like the anime does a decent job at 
showcasing that too. But now is the time to talk about the scene that was dropped. In the grand scheme of things, it's not a scene that has a lot of context, if any. It does not progress the story in any way. It's simply a scene from the battle that... I, I don't even have anything really to say about, except the fact that it is one of the most badass things that I have ever read in the books. I will not even narrate the scene here from the books, I will only show you this amazing illustration by Bikoka on Twitter so you can understand what that scene was like. And that is where the sentiment my body won't give out until my mind does come from. With the amount of HP she has, Asuna is basically in a situation where she can go on until her mind gives in to the pain. However, at this point, she was close to her breaking point and that is why she actually does break when she first sees the light beam approaching from the sky. But once the light arrives and starts taking shape of a familiar figure in a familiar color scheme using a familiar sword skill, Asuna's worries melt like there is no tomorrow. Tsumuji Guruma meaning spiral wheel was a skill she had seen in a different world before, the land of the fairies used by the leader of the samurai themed guild Furin Kazan. Klein slowly rose up from his landing position and apologized from Asuna for the delay as thousands of other beams of light appeared on the sky one after the other. The episode was called the Great Underworld War, however the Great War is just starting now. Ha! <laughs> you all laughed at Klein but his unending determination and passion to help others in need, no matter how dire the situation gets, will be among the highlights of multiple episodes next week and of eternity. With the way the story is written, it's not quite clear how far we're gonna adapt, but I feel confident in stating that we will 100% see the end of Berkuli vs Vector duel, and I do believe the best way to end the next episode will be for the ghost of the past to reveal himself to the SAO survivors. And with that, the actual chaos will begin, you haven't even seen anything yet. Either way, despite the one terrible choice by A1 and an unfortunate cut that happened due to this week not being designed as an Asuna episode, I'm extremely pleased about it. Genuinely, the animation, the sound design, the voice acting, composition, it, it was all absolutely wonderful. But if you made it this far, hit that like button and subscribe and hit the bell icon as well and comment Klein is here to save you down below to let me know. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter for the fastest news possible, Len Squad merch is still around, but now we got Medina, Kirito and Yujiro merch too, so do check them out. A huge thanks to all my patrons and channel members as always, and until next time, stay cool.